You've got it. You've got everything in that movie, and you've got a real crime. And here, this is a chronicle of what this project is. I have to congratulate you. This is absolutely magnificent. <laughs> and, uh, uh, Out on the patio, Ray wanted to make sure I kept all the profanities out of the film. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but I mean, each one is an individual figure. And uh, anyway, look, part of um, you ought to know, and, and, and I, Nergis is what I hope will take over some of this too, is that uh, not only was there one, this drama that you really, this was, I mean, for me, this was reliving the whole thing. I mean, I think for you as well. Wasn't Beautifully it? done. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, but the thing is that, one of the big things was that there were others found. That this was the first one. And thank God, I mean, in other words, even at the end point, when we all opened that box, I'll be perfectly honest with you, I said, we need more before we really believe it. I don't know if that was I, your feeling too, Nergis Wench. Absolutely, and the reason is that you wouldn't expect nature to just put one of these out there and then nothing else. And so we expected this from nature, and in fact, she delivered within a, uh, within a month, one more, and then two months later, a, a third one. So. Yeah, and then another big event took place at this last run, which was sort of amazing. That just as Les said, there, there was this month of August was unbelievable. I mean, we were about to quit. And uh, August delivered two things. One, one of them, uh, I'll just tell you, since you, the movie was a lot about the black hole, and we discovered a different kind of black hole than people had seen before. People had seen single black holes before. And X-ray astronomers in particular had seen single black holes before. The big thing that this did was we discovered that black holes live in pairs. That was not known as well. In fact, we could never really have predicted how many pairs there were out there, because you can't see them. So this was the, the other piece of it was, ah, now we see a signal we know they live together, these black holes. Now, the one problem we had over a long time over the black holes was that we tried to tell people where the black holes were. Now, what I mean by telling people is people who had telescopes both in space and telescopes on the ground. And it would be very interesting for everybody, all the other people doing astrophysics and astronomy, for us to be able to tell them, look, we see one, we see a black hole pair. By the timing of the signals, we try to get a little bit of a feeling about where the position of those black holes is. And we tried to do that, in fact, but it's always very poor with two detectors. You get a big circle in the sky. But fundamentally, you're trying to tell an astronomer, go look over the whole sky, <laughs> over at least that circle. And most astronomers don't know how to do that. They say, give us a position. And what, one of the big things that happened in August, this famous August, was that there is another system just like this, like the LIGO, only with one detector that is in, in, near Pisa in Italy. That was not running with us finally. They had the sensitivity. They had been running with us before we made the detections. And all of us had seen nothing. But then this new instrument, and was also being rebuilt in, in Italy, and they were on the air with us for a detection of all three detectors, the one that is in Hanford, Washington, the one that's in Louisiana, and then also the one that is near Pisa, they all simultaneously made a detection of a black hole. And that made it so that you could make the area of the sky something like 30 square degrees, which is still big for an astronomer, but not thousands of square degrees on the sky. And that gave people a clue where to look. They still didn't see anything. So, that same August, something unbelievable happened. And that's what's on the slide up here. And the thing we saw was actually something we had been hoping to find before the black holes. Now let me tell you, what we saw were two neutron stars, which are stars that are the weight of the sun, about the weight of the sun, about the size of Manhattan. OK? That means you're dealing with something that's enormously dense. And a teaspoon of it, if you stuck it in the in that material would weigh millions of tons. You couldn't lift it. Okay? And it's an enormously dense object because it's so small, weighing the same as the sun. At the end of August, and I don't know, the 17th of August, again one of these dramatic moments, we saw the following signal. And this is the same thing as you saw in the movie. There's a, take a look at the bottom plot. 
The bottom plot is time going along the horizontal direction. And frequency of, that's the sound, of a waveform that's going somewhere from the, oh yeah, the C at the bottom of the piano up to about uh, C above middle C. And you see that yellow line, that nice line? That's a chirp that lasts for a very long time. It la you can see the time. It lasts much longer than the chirp that those black holes made, which lasted for about 0.2 seconds. And that was an indication that we had seen for the first time, and that just happened, two neutron stars doing that dance, and then colliding together. And now here's what they did. They, we see this first, and a little bit after, just a little bit after, you see those, those, those time sequences up above? The very top one is a satellite that is called a Fermi satellite that looks at pulses of gamma rays that are coming out from the outer, that's flying around uh, in orbit around the Earth. And it sees a pulse something like 1.7 seconds after our curve sort of ends. That's when the two neutron stars have gotten so close, they crash together. We suspect they make a black hole. That's what we suspect. And we have a little bit of evidence for that now. And I'll get to that in a second. Anyway, the important thing was, this is the first time, the very first time, that a gravitational wave signal was seen. And shortly thereafter, a signal was seen by something called electromagnetic astronomy. That means kind of things where you have electric fields. Those are due to charges jiggling rather than masses jiggling. And that then was a confirmation of the fact that we had seen something by gravitational means that somebody else saw by electromagnetic means. Can I have the next slide? Ray, can I interject for a moment? Yeah, so one thing that's really ne neat mm. and different about black holes and neutron stars is that black holes are black, yeah. so they don't give off light. So you could point a telescope at a place where you thought two black holes were colliding, and you shouldn't see much. Uh, whereas with neutron stars, when they collide, they're made up of neutrons and, and matter. And in fact, there's a spectacular light show that should be followed by the gravitational waves. And that's really the thing that you're going to see next. So that that the, the first pulse of gamma rays you saw were the very energetic ones, and now will come all the rest of the light. What Nurgis is saying needs what this, this slide to be able to do what they do. And what it is, is a picture of how well we, from the gravitational waves alone, that's now with the three detectors, Louisiana, Hanford, Washington, and the Virgo detector together, could tell where it is. And now you'll see, this is a shape this is sort of looking at the sky as though you're in the middle of, the, of that circle, inside that sphere. That's the way people, astro astronomers draw pictures. They draw a big sphere, and you're sitting in the middle of it looking up at the sky. Can you imagine that? OK. So anyway, those yellow bands that you see that look like bananas up there, the big yellow band is the error circle on the sky, the position in the sky, that comes from just the two LIGO detectors alone. And then the little greener one that's in the middle is, is, comes when you use all three detectors together to localize the source. So there's a, about the best position. And then that gamma ray telescope has that big blue thing. That's about its error bar. Okay? And so with it, you couldn't have really found it. You needed, in fact, the gamma ray that was electromagnetic, but important, the position in the sky was determined by the gravitational waves in, in the best way of all. And here's what Nurgis was saying. The pictures on the, right, on the right are a galaxy, that black blob. If you look at the lower picture, that black blob is a galaxy. I don't know the number of it. I'm not a, maybe you know the number, but I, what is it? You, it's not, not important. It's but not it's important. <laughs> and it's a name. NGC you know, sci science is 4993. <laughs> 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 anyway, but the important thing to notice in that picture is the bottom picture. Uh, and you'll notice that uh, there's a, those black dots around it are other bright objects, but the galaxy itself is the fuzzy thing in the middle. And then, after we made the announcement and the, and, and the, the Fermi satellite had seen it, people began to search in this region, that little error bar of that thing. And what they saw was, a, you can see it, it's a little bit up to sort of at 11 o'clock on the galaxy up there, there is a new dot in the sky. Can you see it? Yes. Good. That was the killer for everybody. Right there, that says, we now know exactly where the new thing was. 
And that then is what's Nurgis, and then Nurgis, maybe you want to tell the story from here. I don't know what's coming next. What no, there, there, there isn't much next. Oh. Let, me see what the next, let me see what the next slide is, but I don't think there's anything. Uh, uh, Ray, well, I, that's what Ray, it is. Ray, maybe you I should leave it at that. I have something to say. Um, yeah. yeah. What I was struck by at the announcement at the National Press Club was how transitory this event was. People don't realize that had you not detected with gravitational waves. Yeah. You might just talk about that. Maybe well, Nurgis would talk yeah, about that. Yeah, let me that. say this. It's not quite that. Well, that they, they made their own people out of the gamma ray telescopes did say where the what they saw. And, and, they, they, and then the, the connection was made. But the point is that it, the, the, the association wasn't made yet. There were two independent <laughs> measurements, the LIGO measurement and the gamma ray measurement. And then they were put together. My god, they were close enough. And now, maybe uh, if you want to go forward, I'll tell you what the other picture is. This is just this is the, 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 is what it is. Right. And then the last picture is that one on the yeah. right, so, which is, whoops. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I can tell yeah. the story. Yeah. We can go yeah. back to the previous uh, yeah. picture. So, so what happens, you notice that the big blue circle was what was seen by the Gamma Ray Observatory, and it's a big circle. And then it made, got made into a much smaller blob on the sky by the gravitational wave telescopes. And that was enough to then send out an alert to over 100 telescopes across the world uh, and it uh, to say, hey, we've seen something you should look to. And it turns out that the source is located uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. And at the time that we detected it, it was daylight in the Southern Hemisphere. So the telescopes had something on the order of 10 hours to prepare themselves to go look for, for this. And the way that astronomers look for something in the sky is typically, that's a really big patch for a telescope to look, look through because, sift through because it's, you know, it looks at a very tiny patch of sky at any given time. So those telescopes all started to point at known galaxies. And very quickly, so this data that you see, the top right that says SWOPE, that was the first telescope to find it. But then of those 70 instruments that looked, uh, pretty much everyone over some number of hours to days saw something. And so what is the something that, that they saw? So these first telescopes were looking at visible light, which is light that our own eyes can see. And we, uh, and we saw over some number of days that this blob, even though it's, it's not color coded here, if you would color code it, it started off that little dot looked very blue. And that's because things were very still hot and energetic at the beginning of this process after the two, two uh, black hole of the two uh, neutron stars collided. And then over a number of days, it starts to redden. It becomes redder. And if, you, if you've ever looked at stars, even with your naked eye in a nice dark place, blue stars are hot, red stars are cool. So we know that there are processes going on in this system in real time, over days, as it was cooling. But what Les says about the transient nature is it's really true. That first gamma ray burst, which actually happens Probably, we think at the moment when the two black hole, or the two neutron stars collide and possibly make a black hole, it sends off this spectacular high energy uh, rays of, uh, uh, you know, of light. Yeah. So that's the process that's been seen. And in fact, it turns out it's still unfolding. The telescopes are still pointing and sources is still, it's getting very, very faint. But in the radio, for example, it's, we still see something. So yeah. let's go to the last slide, the very last slide. Yeah, and now what's going on there is actually what made the newspapers. And the, the piece of science, there's a lot of pieces of science that come out of this. And uh, one of them is that as these smash into each other, there's a process that people have been worrying about for years. In the early days of what's the field of cosmology, which is the field of trying to understand the universe as an entire system, not one star at a time, but the whole universe as a system. Uh, people like George Gamow were, and, and people around him began to think, couldn't you get how all the elements that we are made of, all, you know, hydrogen, helium, boron, beryllium, all the things you learned about in high school, that big periodic table, how did that come about? How did nature do that? And the thing was that uh, the thing that you learn very, once you know a little bit of this, you find out that very, very early in the history of the universe, after the big explosion that made the universe, there is hydrogen. Hydrogen, which is the one piece of water, part of water. And a little bit of helium. Helium, which is that thing that blows up balloons, okay? And, uh, 
But then you can make a very tiny little bit of, in that explosion, that's the universe, you can make a little tiny amount of the next elements, the next heavier elements, a little infinitesimal amount of lithium. And maybe a little even smaller amount of beryllium, which is used, for example, in switches and metals. And where's all this stuff being made? It's made in all the explosion that made the universe. And then you find out, and this was a big, big discovery back in the 50s, 1950s, was that stars make all the other things. When you get, you can make stars out of the early primitive material that I just told you about, mostly hydrogen and helium. But then inside, there's a big cooker inside the star with everything going on. And you can make almost all the elements all the way up to maybe iron, which is the place where most stable nuclei are made. But the thing you couldn't explain, even then, after you found out that the supernova, which are the exploding stars, spread out this stuff all over the universe, you couldn't make the very heavy elements, like, for example, platinum, gold, lead, uranium. They just didn't easily make in stars. And that was a big mystery. And people thought, well, they had to come from some source that involved a lot of neutrons. Those are these particles that have no charge and that these neutrons, neutron stars are made of. They are parts of the nuclei. And it turns out you begin to see that it looks like maybe all, maybe not all, but certainly most of the very heavy elements are made in those collisions of two neutron stars. And that, people had guessed at that before. But now they really saw that it was two neutron stars. They got that from the, from the gravitational wave research. They also found out that gamma ray bursts, a good many of them, the short ones, are, are neutron stars that are colliding together. So all of a sudden, a lot of different puzzles in astronomy got settled by this one observation. So every touch, every piece of astronomy has had a piece of this. Yeah. And that's sort of an amazing part of this whole thing. Yeah, no, I, I think it's, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll just add, I mean, you guys are, are explorers, so you know that most expeditions are nothing but a series of, of hurdles. You cross one and you're immediately working on the next one. Or if you finish an expedition, you're immediately plotting the next one. So this is very similar. The moment you make a discovery, which really what you've done is you've just opened up new questions. And if you look at the black holes, the discovery of the black holes immediately opened up the question of how does nature make black holes that are 30 times the mass of our sun? We hadn't known that she could. When we started this field, and this is mostly due to Kip, uh, Kip, Kip Thorne, who is, you know, you saw, you saw him talking in the movie. Uh, Kip uh, was the one who stressed the most, he stressed hardest of all of us, the idea that when we open this field, and the idea is not to detect a gravitational wave and prove Einstein right, that's very important and lovely, or even prove Einstein a little bit wrong, as Feynman was saying. I mean, Feynman, but I don't know how you got those Feynman clips. I, how much, what do you have to pay to get those? <laughs> I mean, uh, but anyway, so, but, but Feynman's, Feynman is absolutely right. We may yet find that in one deepest sense, there is some place, something not going to completely agree with Einstein. And the, you do this more and more. You look at the black hole waveforms. But there's other things which are, and this is where Kip comes into this. There is, and you can think of it in two ways. Yes, we've detected gravitational waves. That's very important. And, and we've opened thereby a new field of astronomy, which is also very important. That field lets us look at gravity very carefully. And that's a la Feynman. Can we find chinks in gravity? But the other thing is that we may very well find that we can see things that we already know, like, for example, neutron stars or a supernova, which is a star that is dying and collapses, and see that really what's going on inside of a supernova, that would really answer a lot of questions for people who've been thinking about that puzzle for many, many decades, by the way. And uh, so, OK, there are things we know about, and we will see them in a different way through the channel of gravitational waves. That's one positive thing. And Kip will keep reminding us that that's not the only thing. There's going to be things you don't even know about that you may see. Why? Because this is so radically different. It's going to be a really lovely challenge and that we are going to look at things which we, nobody's ever thought about. And that is Kip's big take on what we're going to get out of this field. Well, anyway. Yeah. Here, here. Yeah. Let's take a, we, our time is limited, so let's spend some time and answer some questions. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Who travel at the same speed as light? They travel at the speed of light. And that, thank you for asking that. 
because that was another thing that was beautifully proved in this experiment with the with with the pulsar with the with, with the gamma rays. The fact is that's 130 million light years away. This source, okay? So it takes light 130 million years to get here from that. That's pretty close to us, by the way. You may not think so, but it's pretty damn close, <laughs> okay? And uh, and so 130 million years of travel, and the difference between them coming to us is less than a, less than two seconds. And probably they are identical because it takes a little time. And the collision gets formed, and the fireworks don't start right away after the collision makes. There's a little bit of formation that makes the fireworks. So that's easily could be a second or more. I'm going to ask Nergis, to, just to, because you mentioned this in, uh, parenthetically, explain the standard sirens and why this, the other important part of this discovery mm -hmm. ha has to do with the Hubble constant and uh, measuring the expansion rate of the universe. Yeah, so the Hubble constant is, is just a measure of the rate of expansion of our universe. In other words, it's, really an, imp it's an important number if we want to understand two things. What's the history of our universe and what's our future? So that you can imagine that there is, people are very interested to know what that number is. And until now, what the, the way it's been measured, it's been a number of different measurements of the Hubble constant, but they all require knowing astronomical distances, nearby distances and also at very far away distances. And those are, are measuring the distance of objects, whether they're stars in our neighborhood or galaxies nearby or quasars almost at the edge of the observable universe. Those are all sort of, those are measurements that are filled with, with assumptions, if you will. And so one of the things that people have been very interested in is, is there some independent <coughs> measure of the Hubble constant that you could get by looking at gravitational waves? And that brings in this question of a standard siren. So what's a standard siren? So to know what a standard siren is, before that you have to know what a standard candle is. And so a standard candle in astronomy is some source of light, some kind of star that gives off the same amount of light no matter where you put it, no matter where, where, what part of the universe it's in. So by measuring how much light you see from that particular star, you can tell how far it is. So that's a standard candle. And people have used things like supernovae explosions as standard candles because they're, they're known to have a fixed, um, a, a predictable amount of energy uh, or, or light that's given off. And so the, the analogy is then taken farther to gravitational waves. And one of the things no one has talked about here is that we also sometimes poetically like to refer to gravitational waves as the sounds of the universe. Uh, and make no mistake, these are not sound waves that are traveling across the universe. We like to refer to them as so because it happens to be that the gravitational waves we're measuring happen to be in the human audio band. And so you could take that single, that set of bumps and wiggles, and you could put it on the loudspeaker on your own iPhone, and you could hear it. So those are called the sounds of the universe, and therefore the, the analogy to sirens. So these are sources of gravitational waves that would give off a known amount of gravitational waves. So you could put them anywhere in the universe, and by measuring how strong the signal is, you can tell how far they are. Okay? So that's, and, and so this measurement has been done with these neutron stars uh, to ask what is the Hubble constant, this important number for understanding at the expansion rate. And it turns out that other measurements using, using light, they're quite precise. These are measurements that, are, are that, uh, that know the Hubble constant to within a, 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 a percent, but they don't agree with each other. And, and, and so the measurement that has been done with gravitational waves places the Hubble constant kind of in between the two other numbers that don't agree with each other, uh, but with, with much less precision. So our measurement is nowhere near as good. And so I would say that this is just sort of the first foray into that. This is not the final word no. on, on the Hubble constant by any means. But, uh, but it's sort of, it's comforting that it's not a factor of two away, it's in the ballpark. But it simply tells us that the universe is, is sort of doing understandable things. I'm going to, I've been asked to repeat your questions because we, we are streaming the, uh, this discussion. So. Okay. so I have a question in the vein of planning the next expedition. I would love to mm -hmm. hear two answers. Mm -hmm. um, if you could snap your fingers and pour however many resources into building a new type of sensor that could measure anything to whatever precision you wanted, 
Um, what would that measurement be? And what could we do with that measurement? Go ahead, I think. Okay, so the first thing is we would never snap our fingers because part of the fun is actually building the thing, designing it. So, but imagine that we've done that piece of it. Uh, so there is an actually a worldwide effort going on right now so the, to build more sensitive detectors. And in fact, detectors that could be capable of seeing things we know of, like black holes and neutron stars, out to the edge of the observable universe. That's where first stars were, so that we can capture every neutron star or black hole pair that could be out there. Um, so what's involved? There's a one simple knob that you can turn. I raised to Iman is to, to, to tell you this, but you know, the idea of using interferometers to make these, these measurements is attributed to him. But the, one of the most important things that, that he did was to understand that you couldn't do these with interferometers that were the size of a room, that you had to go to those four kilometer or two and a half mile long uh, instruments. And he understood that the knob you had to turn to make it more sensitive to, was to make it longer. Now, he stopped at four kilometers because that's all the money he could raise. <laughs> yeah. uh, it was a good amount, but you did good. <laughs> Uh, but th th so this next generation of, of detectors, among the technologies that we are trying to, uh, uh, you know, among the, the knobs we'll turn is length. You've got to do that because almost everything else we know how to do, we're kind of running out of out of technical ability in these four kilometer long detectors. So in, the, in Europe, there is planning going on for a 10 kilometer long detector. In the US, people are starting to think about a 40 kilometer long detector. Uh, so that's length. And then there's a host of other technologies that, that would help you still further. And I'll just put out one technology out there. So it turns out if you ask why couldn't you make advanced LIGO or Virgo better than it is today, it's because we use laser as our sort of as our, our meter stick. So here's the way to understand it. What's the role of the laser? The laser, if I asked you to measure a length of, of a piece of paper, you would pull out a ruler and you would measure it. And you do it by looking at the tick marks on the ruler. Now imagine I gave you a kind of a kooky ruler where the tick marks keep sort of swishing around. <laughs> How well would you be able to measure the length of your piece of paper? Not so well. Well, it turns out that's what our laser light does, even though it's, very, very, it's much smaller tick marks than on a ruler, they're swishing around because of quantum mechanics. So quant quantum mechanics is causing uncertainty. And so one of the technologies that we're using is we're trying to do what is called quantum engineering to make the tick marks on our ruler, which is the laser light, uh, behave better. So that's one example. But there are many, there's at least a dozen new technologies that have to come into this. Yeah. Second row. Um, what about building it in space? That's what I want to say something about. Um, Let me do that one because when we, there are other techniques, and I, I think before we quit, you ought to at least know what they are. Okay, and uh, but you pay. They, they, and th there are at least three other things you ought to know about. There's a real field here that is much greater than what LIGO on the ground can do. And the next thing, but you, it's a different kind of science that you're doing. You're still doing gravitational wave science, but for example, a, a effort the United States and the Europeans have been at for almost as long as LIGO is to build something called LISA which is the laser interferometer space antenna. And that is an idea that is a triangle, but with arms that are about 1 million, 1.5 million kilometers on a side. It's, a tri it's, a isos it's an isosceles triangle, uh, equ equilateral triangle, in fact. And you float that in space. And then you have a sensitivity for a different wavelength of gravitational waves. And there, there are many, many sources, black holes that are much heavier than the ones we're looking at. And also, uh, even white dwarf binary stars will show up. And they hope to have a system running like this by 2032. Now with the Europeans and the Americans together. Then there's a technique which is done by purely watching. And that is going on right now. That's using pulsars. These are these stars we talked about that make these very periodic pulses. And monitoring the pulse rate of many different pulses, but many different pulsars in our own galaxy. And if a gravitational wave comes through our galaxy, the pulsars will start changing their rate a little bit. In fact, you'll get a very interesting pattern. Gravitational wave comes through the galaxy, 
those, those pulsars that are in the north of the sky and those in the southern part of the sky will go a little faster. The ones in the east and the west will go a little slower. And you can look for that. And people, people with radio telescopes are trying to do this right now. That will measure gravitational waves with periods of years. And then finally, there's something which is actually even more fascinating than anything we've talked about. <laughs> uh, and that is something which is called the cosmic background radiation polarization. That's a very big mouthful, a little complicated, but let me tell you what it is up to the point so at least you can get an image of it. And that is that many of you probably know about the, <clears throat> the cosmic background radiation. It's a radiation that you can listen to on a radio, an FM radio or a TV station that makes some of the static. It's that heat radiation that remains from the huge explosion that started the whole universe. That radiation, sort of what you're looking at, is the radiation of 300,000 years after the big explosion. That's what we're seeing when we measure that radiation. And what the idea is that because these gravitation waves don't scatter, and that's related to that, that they go through everything, one could, in principle, look at the gravitational radiation that may have happened at the moment when the universe came out of the vacuum, suddenly got created. That's the current myth of how the universe started. Okay? And that is associated with a tremendous amount of acceleration. Matter is being accelerated dramatic amounts. And a huge amount of gravitational radiation came out of that moment at the moment when that happened. That radiation, at that 300,000 years after the explosion, it's stretching the plasma in one direction and compressing it in another and causing hot spots and cold spots in the plasma. And that plasma then will have a polarization, which is the direction in which the electric field points. And that polarization pattern will be different. And uh, that will be characteristic of the gravitational waves that made the densities change like that in the plasma. And that was looked for, as being looked for right now in many, many places. There was a ma mistake made about three years ago where there was a big announcement made where the people who were doing that kind of experiment thought they had seen it. And it was a mis well, it was nothing, that wasn't a mis it was a, it was an error that they were, they were fooled a little bit by the dust in our own galaxy. But they're doing the experiment again, and many, many other people have joined them. And I expect that within the next 10 years, there's going to be a, either a real discovery of those gravitational waves, or a statement said, says it's so small it's impossible to see. One of those two. We don't know the answer. And that would be really quite dramatic, because it would be the only real evidence we have of what happened at the very instant when the universe got created. Now, you can probably do that some number of decades from now by an interferometric system in space. But not LIGO and Virgo will not do that. It's just, it's just too small. And Lisa may not do that. What? Lisa may not do that. No, Lisa probably won't do it either. Yes. You have to design a very special kind of Lisa. It's, in fact, it has a name. It's called Big Bang Observer. They even given it a name already. <laughs> it's a really hard experiment. Yeah, it's a stinker. It, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's a really good question. And you saw some of that in, 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 the, in the movie with Alessandra Buono and, and her group. So really what you do is the templates are made. Uh, th there's a, a, a couple of ways to do it. The f one is to use numerical solutions to Einstein's uh, equations, and that's really compute intensive. So computers can't generate those fast enough. So what people typically do is you, you, you generate a few solutions using, uh, using supercomputers. And then you try to try and match those solutions using pen and paper calculations, which are much faster and, and, and quicker to compute. Once you can match those for a few example cases and you trust your pen and paper calculation, then the rest of the templates are generated using just the pen and paper calculation. So it's a big set of computer code that basically says, in, in the case of, of, of the first detection of black holes, there were 250,000 templates. And what are, why do you need that many? Because each one of those templates encodes in it, each one of those waveforms encodes the masses of the black holes. We don't know what mass we should expect. It codes the distance. We don't know how far they are. And encodes actually 
14 different parameters. What's the inclination of the orbit? What's how, how, how much do they spin? What's the direction of the spin? So you add up all of those things. There's a lot of information. And this is actually one of the most amazing things about Einstein's equations, is that they're incredibly beastly in the sense that they're hard to solve. But encoded in them is detailed information about these systems. And so the templates are made by taking, so real summary, taking a, s a small set of numerical solutions, matching them with calculations, and then using those calculations to generate the 250,000 templates. So. In back, yeah. Yeah, me too. No, me. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. And I um, think this will be our last question. That's how you wait. Cool. Uh, uh, well, now that you have observed, uh, confirmed observation, observations of uh, black hole collision as well as neutron star collisions, what would be the next cosmological event or any event for that matter that you would let me take that. I, I'll answer my own way. The question, I'm going to repeat the question for the cameras. Um, we have neutron star, neutron star. We have black hole, black hole collisions. What are, what, is the, what are some of the other options that you would expect to see? So I'll start with the things that we know we might be able to see. And one of the, the, the remaining things that we know of that we ought to be able to see is supernovae. And so these are stars like our own sun that uh, essentially collapse, and in that process of collapsing, they act, have an explosion of a shock wave that goes out, and that gives off gravitational waves. And we should be able to see that. The problem is, two, there's two, two problems with, with that observation. One is it's pretty hard because we aren't sensitive to being able to see them very far out. And in our own galaxy, we expect a, a star typically uh, goes uh, in the, into this supernova state about once per 100 years. So you can imagine it's a, it's a waiting game. Uh, so that's the things we know. I, I think, for me, the most exciting thing that could come out next is, 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 is a headline that says, you know, gravitational wave scientists see an object, and they have no bleep clue what it is. <laughs> So that, I think that's really where, where, where this should go next. And uh, Ray will have his own version. <laughs> no, no, I just... He won't fact, say bleep, he'll actually say it. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, there are so many strange things that the geometry of general relativity can have. I don't know, how many of you have seen Interstellar, that movie that, that Kip Thorne was so deeply mixed up with? Uh, and I, by the way, Kip was very proud of the fact that there's nothing in that movie that could not be scientifically possible. Doesn't mean that nature makes it. It says the theory, the general theory of relativity, all the things in that movie are possible in the general theory of relativity. In many theories of physics, there are many solutions that nature didn't choose to go, by the way. That, that's mathematics has more solutions than nature will allow sometimes. And so I'm fully expecting that maybe we'll see a wormhole. A wormhole? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and what, I'll tell you how we'll see it. We'll see it that there is a special place in the sky where we see more than we should of gravitational waves. It's not isotropic. It's not uniformly distributed. And that will be the connection to another very interesting spot. So let me just add, close with, uh, <laughs> it. in some uh, th thought processes, a wormhole is expected to, to, to be the portal to a parallel universe, and we can leave it there. Uh. <laughs> <laughs>